Britain may be a small island, but it has a staggering variety of geology. From the impact of glaciers over the last three million years to the most ancient rocks 3,000 million years old. The most ancient rocks in Europe, close to being the most ancient in the world, can be found in northwest Scotland, particularly the Outer Hebrides islands of Harris and Lewis. Coincidentally, this phenomenally ancient landscape was used as the alien planet through the Stargate in Kubrick's 1968 sci-fi epic 2001 A Space Odyssey. On this journey, we are going to go on a time odyssey. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative day. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. You don't have to take a ferry to the Hebrides if you want to see ancient Luasian Nice, the name of this ancient rock. You can find it on the mainland in the northwest of Scotland, and even some on Skye. If you do visit the island, it takes about 1 hour 40 minutes from Skye, and costs a few pounds for foot passengers, about 60 pounds for a car return, but a mass of 180 for camper vans. When it comes to ferries in Scotland, there are plenty of subsidies, but not if you're a tourist with a big truck, which is only fair given your taxes aren't subsidising these journeys. The island of Harris is not separated from the island of Lewis, and combined it's a very big island. It will take you about two hours to drive from the north to the south. It's also very popular, so for accommodation you need to book early. Many come for a long stay, for the almost monastic experience of being on the edge of the world. Well, the most northwesterly land on the Atlantic coast. But if you're on a tighter schedule, then a long weekend to a week will suffice. There really is only Stornoway as the largest town. The main activity is just soaking up this awesome scenery. I'm covering the Neolithic Stone Circle of Kalanish Complex in another video, which is also a must-see, but on this occasion I'm here for the landscape, or rather the underlying geology. It's a landscape that started its life very early on in the history of the planet, and how amazing is that? And it's on our doorstep, no trekking to the icy wilderness of Greenland or Canada, or the remote deserts of Australia. This is a couple of days driving, and there's broadband and plenty of places to park up the camper. There are even golf courses. I suppose a question lurking is, how do we know how old the rock really is? So 200 years ago, many believed the world to be a mere 6,000 years old. In the early years of geology, deductive reasoning and the collection of fossils led to the understanding of different geological ages. Layers of sediment filled with different bones and shells and creatures that defy a young Earth, and this is known as relative dating. A strata with fossils of a certain dinosaur will be of a comparative age. If there are, say, fish fossils in the strata below, then they are going to be older. Like tree rings, each strata having a relative age based on the fossils. About 120 years ago, it was conceived that perhaps the Earth may be 100 million years old. It was only with the understanding of radioactive decay, a century ago, that a method was devised that the true age was obtained. In the case of Luasian Nice, this was as recently as the 1960s. Radiometric dating looks at how unstable isotopes of an element, like carbon decay, carbon-14 being the best known, and it decays at a set rate, like an atomic clock. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,700 years, which means that anything that is 70,000 years or younger with remains of living carbon can be accurately dated within a few hundred years. There are other methods, and of course combining methods to cross-reference findings. Rocks are of course older, and don't have living carbon. Uranium found in igneous rocks will eventually decay to lead over billions of years, and potassium-bearing rocks likewise have an isotope that decays to argon. Potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.3 billion years, and common in crystals found in Luasian gneiss. Dating rocks is simply a matter of sampling and doing the calculations based on the amount of potassium-40 and the amount of argon. There are older rocks in the world. There is the gneiss of Canada and Greenland that are nearly 500 million years older, but when we get to a billion years, 
a thousand million years, we are on the edge of eternity. And as I've said, these locations are a much longer track to get to. The rocks you see were formed deep in the Earth's crust. This is magma that rose up and froze somewhere on the planet over three billion years ago. That's 1.6 billion years after the Earth was born. In those first 1,500 million years, a period known as the Hadean, named after the Greek Hades, it was a fiery hell with asteroids bombarding the planet. When Earth looked like Mustafa from Revenge of the Sith. Okay, not 2001, but sci-fi say kind of close enough. The planet cooled down around 4 billion years ago. For the next 1,500 million years, the Earth ended into the Archean, which is Greek for ancient. And it's during this period the rocks you see were formed. And it was an alien and unfamiliar Earth. The moon would have been much larger in the sky. The tides were greater, and the day not 24 hours, but 12 hours, 3.5 billion years ago, and only 18 hours, a billion years later. After half a billion years of this genesis, the Earth had cooled and was a featureless and endless shallow ocean, which initially had no continents. There were some islands, microcontinents, that grew up out of the mantle, and they collided to form the first continent called Cratons. The first life, Cyanobacteria, emerged at this time 3.4 billion years ago, and it formed microbial mats in shallow waters, building strange colonies like hard corals called stromatolites, the bacteria cementing minerals to form these strange structures, and although rare, can be found in salty water in Western Australia today. Earth, despite being a watery planet, was not hospitable. The atmosphere was carbon dioxide and methane. The sky was a green haze. The sun was dim. Stars take a few billion years to properly fire up. But the carbon dioxide and methane, both powerful greenhouse gases, stopped the planet from freezing despite the sun being only three quarters as bright. The seas were pretty gross, with no oxygen dissolved in them, but a lot of sulphur in the form of hydrogen sulphide. The Earth was a massive stink bomb. Despite this, it was hospitable enough for single-celled organisms that could photosynthesize the carbon and sunlight and burp out oxygen. After 300 million years of slime, photosynthetic bacteria being the rulers of the Earth they made enough oxygen for it to react with the methane in the atmosphere and the sky turned blue about 2 to 2.4 billion years ago. Well, this oxygen caused a mass die-off of single-celled anaerobic bacteria in the sea, but it was a bit of a lucky break for single-celled organisms that liked oxygen. Over this period, the Waitian Nights was dragged around in the crust to be folded like putty, heated and placed under huge pressures. It is this that has metamorphized, the granites being separated and the crystals into distinctive dark and light strips. You can see clearly in this rock face on the mainland, the lighter original granite that has been squished and folded and transformed, with the later pink granite injected into it, within the crust, 20 kilometers and more deep. And then the black basalt that was the last to be intruded. This was near or very close to the surface, given basalt, although chemically similar to granite, and it's called quickly, leaving it a fine crystal structure rather than the coarse visible crystals found in granite that took much longer to cool so as to allow the crystals to grow. If you imagine I'm standing in the present, and the end of this beach is the beginning of Earth, it gives an idea of how far back we have to travel. Not so much a star gate, but a time gate. A pause here, because that brief distance overshoots humanity's existence. Our most ancient ape-like ancestors lived about 5.8 million years ago.
The landscape you see spent much of its time buried under other rocks. A billion years ago, the northwest of Scotland, including the Outer Hebrides, were part of a major supercontinent. Hundreds of millions of years before the better known supercontinents of Gondwana and Pangaea existed, and plate tectonics hadn't fired up, and the microcontinents had coalesced into one large, rather boring continent named Nuna. Northwest Scotland was on the western edge of this continent, at the equator. It was a continent devoid of life, where an early form of plate tectonics pushed up mountains. These were rained on, eroded, and they washed down sand and gravel for a billion years in what is known as the Boring Billion, 1.8 billion to 800 million years ago. And the layers of sand and gravel can now be seen in Scotland on the mainland, it's called Terudionian sandstone and forms the oldest mountains, as well as stunning sea stacks and smothered the Lewasian gneiss in sediment. Here, the recent glaciation of ice ages, a mere million years ago, have carved out the sandstone to reveal the original valleys that were carved into the gneiss. You are looking at 1.2 billion year old valley, which is only a little bonkers. Between 2.5 and 1.5 billion years ago, the mountains of West Harris were formed. These mountains are igneous granite, again formed deep underground and intruded into an already ancient land. About 1.1 billion years ago, Nuna broke up, with the biggest continent becoming Rodinia, which is centered around Russia. With Northwest Scotland now having Greenland and North America, continent of Laurentia moving down to its west, and now south of the equator. Then plate tectonics got going. During the Cambrian, the seas exploded with different forms of life. The Hebrides were on the edge of a sea where sand washed up in the Ordovician and it was submerged with calcium rich mud forming limestone. The Calizoni Orogeni, as continents collided, raised up mountains on the mainland, but here it pushed the land above sea level seeing deposits previously laid down are eroded away back to the base Lewasian gneiss. In the Triassic, now landlocked in Pangaea, the tropical rains washed sand and pebbles and deposited by rivers in low-lying valleys. Most of this on Lewis has been eroded away, but some remains around Stornoway. 205 million years ago, in the Jurassic, shallow seas returned, teeming with life of corals and bivalves and nanomites and thick layers of limestone, sandstone and mudstone were formed. Around the edge of the shallow sea, dinosaurs roamed. The Cretaceous, despite being the true era of dinosaurs, again saw much of the area submerged, with chalk formed from the bodies of tiny algae being laid on the sea floor. Unlike the South of England, where you can see the chalk deposits, they were quickly eroded away here. 
a mere 60 million years ago, the North Atlantic widened. The thinning crusts or volcanoes erupt in the Inner Hebrides, and this also uplifted the Outer Hebrides, and it saw the erosion of the layers of rock laid down over the previous 150 million years, again revealing the ancient Loisian gneiss. At the same time, an asteroid brought the end of the age of dinosaurs, although technically non-alien dinosaurs, the birds are still around. Within a few million years, rapid warming saw the seas expand and the palms growing in the Arctic Circle, so perhaps the peaks of the Hebrides looked like tropical islands. 30 million years ago, cooling occurred with sea levels falling and the islands covered in forest, which we would find more familiar. And of course, over the last 3 million years, there have been pulses of ice sheets that rolled over this landscape, obliterating everything in its path. I don't want to come across as some wishy-washy hippie, but I cannot come away from this landscape not transformed. Some would say it's spiritual, which is absolutely fine. On the one hand, this is an incredibly ancient land, and I'm taking it on trust. Three billion years is unimaginable. It's an eternity. It has no credibility, and it's simply my rational mind keeping it in some kind of perspective. And yet our lives are tiny. Humanity's existence is a blink in the eye of these geological gods. Yet within this feeling of insignificance is the pride in us monkey people, who've been able to work out the secrets of the planet, to be able to read it like a book. Each rock a word, each strata a sentence, every cliff and mountain a paragraph, every continent a chapter, and Scotland is blessed in having such a full chapter. It's a book, it's Earth's autobiography, that we little humans have learned to read. And that's pretty awesome. So, thanks for watching. Like, comment and subscribe. And if you want to learn more about geology from real geologists doing videos, there's a link in the description.